Um, so, Ian, do you want to kick yep. it off? <coughs> yep, thanks for turning up. Um, by the way, how much do people know about Newton before they kick off? Nothing? Not a lot of background. Uh, some, I think I read maybe uh, like one of those horrible histories kind of thing about Isaac Newton. Mm -hmm. Not, yeah, not much more than that. Okay. Ed, do you know? Do you yeah, know? not much. Not much? Not much, no. I, I generally, this is not sarcasm. I generally thought you knew everything about everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's in a way, that's good because uh, then some of this might be new. So let, let me kick off. Um, so uh, 1665, um, Isaac Newton left Cambridge to return to his family home in Lincolnshire escaped the worst outbreak of bubonic plague uh, since the Black Death of 1348. And his next three years were spent in uh, productive isolation. And during this period, he demonstrated that white light is composed of coloured light. He explained that the same universal law of gravity governs the movement of heavenly and earthly bodies. And he developed his theory of fluxions, which laid the foundation of his approach to the calculus which is perhaps the most important advance in the history of mathematics. And Newton's ambitions also extended to finding a cure for the plague. He proposed, begin quote, the best cure is a toad suspended by the legs in a chimney for three days, which at last vomits up earth with various insects in it onto a dish of yellow wax and shortly after dies, combining powdered toad with the excretions and serum made into lozenges and worn about the affected area, drives away the contagion and draws out the poison." End quote. So we can view that as medieval eccentricity, but Newton would have seen little difference between his experiments in optics and his experiments in plague medicine. He believed, after all, that all matter was ultimately composed of a single protein substance and in the first edition of the Principia, published in 1687, he asserted that, begin quote, any body can be transformed into another of whatever kind, and all the intermediate degrees of qualities can be induced in it, end quote. And so the cure for the plague could indeed be hi hiding within the body of a toad. And as we know, many modern medicines are sourced from the natural world so Newton's cure might appear to be magical hocus pocus, but it has the same scientific intent and content as his other more successful experiments. Newton had one foot in the, his present, which was the enchanted world of medieval Christianity, which was ultimately animated by occulted spirits. And he had another foot in the emerging disenchanted world of the scientific revolution which is animated by inhuman forces, mechanisms, and laws. And in consequence, some of Newton's other activities are even harder to understand from the point of view of modern science. For example, the enchanted Newton believed that God had originally gifted pristine knowledge of an authentic theology to ancient peoples, which had subsequently been corrupted and forgotten. The Bible and other ancient texts therefore contain secret wisdom that when properly interpreted according to Newton's own rules of exegesis could reveal God's design. And on this basis Newton prophesied with supernatural accuracy that the Jewish people would return to Palestine in 1944 he also prophesied that the world would end in a transformative apocalypse no earlier than 2060. That's good news for some of us. He wrote a historical chronology of pre-Christian ancient kingdoms uh, covering the first millennium BC in an effort to mine the past for glimpses of this original theology. He accepted the existence of centaurs as historical fact he asserted that God had made King Solomon the greatest philosopher of the world and the design of Solomon's temple was a divinely inspired model of the solar system. And we could go on. Newton was a spooky fellow and to our modern minds presents 
a beguiling mixture of extreme irrationality and rationality. And so this enchanted Newton it became something of an intellectual embarrassment to the more disenchanted intellectual environment of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. And this spooky side of Newton was buried. It wasn't until the 20th century and the rediscovery of Newton's non-scientific manuscripts that a fuller and more complete picture was re-established. And the turning point was Keynes's, um, The Economist's uh, 1946 declaration after reading Newton's alchemical manuscripts that Newton was, begin quote, the last of the magicians, end quote. Because for Newton, the entire universe was, quote, a cryptogram set by the Almighty, full of occult secrets for those able to decipher them, which could restore the lost primordial knowledge, reveal God's design and precipitate a new Jerusalem. Newton aimed to understand nature in order to understand God's design, and his scientific work on mechanics, gravity, chemistry, optics, and the calculus were all pieces of this universal puzzle. Now, in the Principia, um, his, his main publication, which um, presented the law of gravity, uh, mathematicized um, laws of motion, um, he presented this law of universal attraction purely in purely mathematical terms. And it explained the orbits of the planets with a high degree of accuracy given the measurements of his day. And that was hugely successful, but a residual question remained, which was what was the nature of the gravitational force and how did it operate? Uh, Descartes, writing before Newton was born, proposed that all matter is immersed in, a, in an invisible but substantial medium called the ether. God is the unmoved mover who at the beginning of time first set matter into motion. Subsequently, all matter moves mechanically, hitting and interacting with the ether and other bodies via direct physical contact without the intervention of God. And Newton initially believed that the gravitational force was transmitted mechanically through the ether. Now, if the universe really is filled with ether, then the movement of huge masses like the planets would deviate from the predictions of the law of gravity due to ether resistance, just as projectiles in the Earth's atmosphere deviate <coughs> from the laws of motion due to air resistance. But no celestial retardation of the planets could be observed. So Newton hedged in the Principia. He wrote that the law of attraction might be due to, quote, the actions of the bodies themselves, or, quote, agitating each other by spirits emitted, or, quote, the action of the ether, or of the air, or of any medium whatever, whether corporeal or incorporeal, end quote. Now, whatever the actual explanation, the mathematical description will remain the same. And as a natural philosopher, Newton was interested in the nature of gravity, and he allowed himself to speculate, but he wouldn't commit without experimental evidence. Now, traditionally, the ether was believed to exist because a pendulum swinging in the vacuum jar would eventually come to rest. And Newton finally convinced himself of the non-existence of ether by experimenting first with a hollow pendulum and then with a pendulum filled with substances of different densities. If the ether existed and interacted with matter on the smallest scales, on all scales, then a filled pendulum should come to rest more quickly than, than a hollow one, but he observed no such effect. And so his vision of the universe shifted and he began to view it as composed mainly of empty space. And that meant that the law of attraction implied action at a distance, and matter affects matter without mechanical contact. So he needed a new kind of causal explanation, which was non-mechanical, in the sense of not passively responding to already existing motion uh, via direct contact. Now, consistent with his belief in an intellectual fall, he turned to ancient beliefs for a possible answer. And in the early 1700s, he wrote that, again, quote, it seems to have been an ancient opinion 
that matter depends on a deity for its laws of motion as well as for its existence. End quote. Now, Newton was a Christian, but his precise theological views were quite unorthodox. Most Christians uphold the Trinitarian doctrine that God has three forms, Father, Holy Spirit, Christ, but nonetheless is one being uncreated and eternal. And the early Christian views were much more diverse. So the Bishop Arius, who lived in Alexandria in the third century BC, held that Jesus was the Son of God but was created in time, and therefore Christ was not identical and co-eternal with God, but a subordinate emanation. This view was eventually condemned as heresy by the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Newton's close study of the Bible convinced him that there was no scriptural support for Trinitarianism. And although Newton accepted the possibility of events that defied human explanation, such as the miracle of turning water into wine, he couldn't accept the mathematical impossibility of the Trinitarian doctrine where one equals three and three equals one. And Newton therefore became convinced of the correctness of Arianism. And he viewed the Trinitarian theology of the Roman Catholic Church as a corruption of the original and authentic theology. Sorry, lost my place. So the idea that an active agent, the superhuman will of a god, explained action at a distance was consistent with Newton's Arianism, in which Christ was God's first creation with a purely spiritual body. At a point in history, he became incarnate as flesh in the form of a man to redeem humanity. Christ's death on the cross, his resurrection, actually returned Christ to his original spiritual form, and therefore Christ always was a kind of animating spirit of the world, or Logos, present everywhere, but occulted, mediating between God and his creation, enacting his father's will. Newton speculated that it was the invisible hand of Christ who enforced the law of gravity, who literally moved things around. And this spookiness of Newton's theory of gravity was noted by Leibniz, who wrote that, begin quote, the rebirth in England of a theology that is more than papist and a philosophy entirely scholastic since Mr. Newton and his partisans have revived the occult qualities of the school with the idea of attraction, end quote. I'm sure that wasn't really Leibniz's voice, but there you go. Um, so for Newton, the movement of celestial bodies is therefore not merely mechanical, but it's also spiritual. Newton's Christ was a cosmic Christ, like a, a universal animism, which he believed was present not just in the heavens, but also in mundane matter upon earth. And around 1667, Newton therefore turned his attention to alchemy, which would keep him obsessively occupied for over 25 years. So let's uh, just turn to Newton's alchemy for a moment. So the Emerald Tablet, is a short fragment dating from between 200 and 300 AD, supposedly written by the mythical figure Hermes Trismegistus, which means Hermes the Thrice Great. And Hermes is not a person, but a, a Greco-Egyptian god, and therefore the Emerald Tablet, supposedly, like the Bible, is of divine origin. Now, Newton translated the Emerald Tablet and wrote a commentary on it. And the tablet contains this famous line, which you may have heard of, to begin quote, that which is below is like that which is above, and that which is above is like that which is below, end quote. And that, uh, that line continues, quote, to do the miracles of one only thing. And as all things have been and arose from one by the mediation of one, so all things have their birth from this one thing by adaptation, end quote. 
That is actually Newton's uh, translation. So Hermes, the god, seems to be telling us mere mortals that all the miracles of nature are the progeny of an original mercurial one, and therefore everything inherits the one's fundamental and universal properties, and in consequence, nature is self-similar at all scales. Now, the Hermetic literature is full of occult affinities between things that we would now consider disconnected. On the other hand, we now take the unity of the laws of nature for granted, and we can view Newton's laws of motion, which unify Kepler's celestial mechanics with Galileo's terrestrial mechanics as a vindication of this hermetic proposition that the microcosm and the macrocosm are fundamentally similar. An alchemist, due to the influence of hermetic metaphysics, dreamt big. Um, many believe that all substances were formed from a primordial, singular, original substance. And if all emanates from an original one, then starting with uh, mundane materials in the laboratory, we might be able to reverse that process of emanation and gain access to philosopher's mercury, which is a godlike substance with the magical power of pure potentiality. So alchemists dreamt of discovering an elixir of everlasting life, the universal cure for all illnesses, and the worldly riches by transmuting lead into gold. Newton adopted the alchemical pseudonym One Holy God, and he spent 25 years in furtive chemical research, holed up in a wooden shed adjoining his room in Cambridge, slaving in semi-darkness over a hot furnace, surrounded by shelves laden with alchemical texts, glass jars, crucibles, retorts. Newton wasn't really interested in worldly riches. He wanted to understand how the world worked, and he had an open mind, always ready to alter his beliefs in light of new evidence. But given his faith, the possibility of distilling a godlike substance from the mundane forms of everyday life must have been a siren call. Newton wanted, as he described it, to get at, quote, the fire at the heart of the world, end quote. So once again, Newton's Arianism enlivened his scientific investigations with metaphysical speculation. Alchemists, some alchemists have proposed that the philosopher's Mercury was in fact the manifestation of the god Hermes himself. But for Newton, this was a pagan corruption of the real truth. He wondered whether it was possible that Christ, as the Son of God and mediator of God's will in the world, not only organised the macrocosm through the law of gravity, but also the microcosm as the hidden mercurial spirit in the heart of matter. As Newton called it, the condensed spirit of the world, the philosophical Mercury, could be the cosmic Christ. Newton wrote copious notes in the cryptic allegorical language of alchemy, totaling about one million words. And despite his enormous efforts, he failed to reduce chemistry uh, to universal mathematical laws. No one in the 17th century, not even a genius such as Newton, could have cracked that particular cryptogram. Now, in 1693, Newton suffered some kind of nervous breakdown, probably from obsessive overwork, and he stopped his work in alchemy. He hadn't managed to distill Christ out of mundane matter. He hadn't discovered how to transmute lead into gold. And he was neither spiritually or materially better off. And this failure uh, precipitated uh, a revolutionary change in his career. So in 1696, when he was 54 years old, Newton accepted an offer to become warden of the Royal Mint. He left Cambridge and the academic life and took up lodgings in London and started a new career as servant of the crown. At that time, England's silver coins were very old and worn out and they were easy to counterfeit and so no one trusted their metallic content. Prices 
were inflating to compensate for counterfeit coins. Workers were getting upset and rioted when paid in coins made from tin or coins clipped to almost nothing. Commerce of the nation, nation was under threat. And so Newton was therefore charged with recoining the nation's currency and establishing a trustworthy monetary standard. And that meant withdrawing the old coins, uh, manufacturing high quality new coins and cracking down on counterfeiting. And he took to this task with his usual obsessive energy. For example, he conducted time and motion study of coin production. He proposed changes to increase the efficiency uh, of production. He opened up new mints up and down the country. He put his alchemical studies to use by ensuring strict quality control of the minting process. He introduced new milk coins, which reduced clipping. He did loads of things. But uh, counterfeit coins still remained a problem. So Newton personally tracked down counterfeiters, following leads into public houses and brothels. He conducted hundreds of cross-examinations of suspects who were typically poor and desperate people. And his evidence led to the hanging of 27 people between 1697 and 1698. And the worst offenders were publicly hung, drawn and quartered. So in the space of a few years, Newton had revolutionized the operations of the Royal Mint. He was promoted from warden to master. He became an MP. He was elected president of the Royal Society. He became wealthy. He received a royalty percentage on every minted coin. So although Newton the alchemist failed to transmute lead into gold, Newton the moneyer succeeded in transmuting ordinary metal into the currency of the realm. And in doing so, received a share of the state's scenerage profit. So perhaps Newton was not only the last magician, but the first truly successful alchemist. In Newton's 21 years at the Mint, he seems to have mainly concerned himself with the proper physical medium of money. You know, its substance, its weight, compared to its nominal value, how to manufacture it. Collected foreign coins, analysed their composition. He did express economic opinions to Parliament. For example, he believed that issuing unbacked paper money might stimulate commerce, but he didn't develop any significant economic theory. He focused entirely on the physical, not social, properties of money. For example, the nature of economic value never seemed to trouble him at all. So in the divine cosmos, a universal animism reigns, which imposes a beautiful order. But in the profane world of economics, populated by chiselers, clippers, counterfeiters and market hagglers, and where, as Newton wrote, quote, he could not calculate the madness of the people, end quote. It was only sovereign state power and Puritan morals that prevented social breakdown. The world of money was godless and there were no occult properties for Newton's intelligence to discover. So let me come to a close and pose a few themes that we might like to consider. So Newton combined medieval faith with this emerging scientific materialism. He was careful to separate his mathematical and experimentally verified natural philosophy from his theological metaphysical speculations. But for him, mechanism and spirit were real. And so Newton oscillated between material and spiritual explanations. For Newton, matter is passive and lacks will or cognition. Once set in motion, off it goes, predictable and clockwork-like. A spirit, in contrast, is active and it has a will, has a design. It can be the cause of new motion. Christ, the occult spirit of the world, might act upon passive matter and be the ultimate cause of action at a distance, actually be the mercurial spirit that shapes and governs the many forms of matter and occasionally enacts miracles. The idea that some mechanisms in virtue of their causal structure might have a will and be the actual cause of new motion would have been an alien thought to Newton. So too would be the proposition that all gods, big and small, might have a purely social reality. Newton discovered universal laws in nature, but believed that an occult spirit ultimately enforced those laws, but he didn't really know how. And this strict demarcation between mechanism and spirit probably made it easier for the subsequent Newtonian revolution to drop those spirits altogether 
and become purely mechanistic, full of laws without agents of the law. And although Newton didn't develop any economics himself, Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, published some 50 years after Newton's death, was directly influenced by, by him. Smith proposed that market prices gravitate around their natural prices, sometimes above or below, but always near their, quote, centre of gravity, which was determined not by the haggling in the market, but by cost of production. Smith, following Newton, viewed the economy as a law-bound system of matter in motion. But Smith's laws of economics were mechanistic, not animistic. The, in <coughs> the invisible hand of the market only metaphorically suggests the in intervention of an occult will that orders passive matter. For Smith and his modern followers, the invisible hand is merely the unintended consequence of individual human wills pursuing their own rational ends. God is not mentioned once in the wealth of nations. Commerce, of course, has a moral dimension, but Smith thought it should be free from the interference of religion, especially extracting tithes, which, according to Smith, hindered the improvement of land. Capitalism then went on to obliterate all religious obstacles to its growth and dominion. John Desagulier, member of the Royal Society and Grand Master of Freemasonry in England, was an energetic promoter of the Newtonian system, and he gave hundreds of lectures and demonstrations to promote it. He wrote an allegorical poem called The Newtonian System of the World, the Best Model of Government. And in it, he proposed that the universal laws of attraction, which achieved order in the universe, could also achieve a just and harmonious society where liberty and mutual commerce was maintained with mathematical precision overseen by a limited monarchy. So the enchanted world of Newton, where Christ was universally present in all things, uh, was retreating. And this new bourgeois realm of economics was an entirely secular affair, rationally and spontaneously organised by impersonal and natural laws. And a new myth of a dis disenchanted realm of economics, modern and entirely free of medieval and religious superstition, remains with us uh, down to this day. And there I'll stop. Thank you. Um, next meeting will be same time next week, but not uh, here. It will be in the town hall at 7.30 on Thursday. That's Thursday the 16th. Uh, when the topic will be 17th century calculating machines. That then brings this run of meetings to an end and um, we'll have over this we'll have three meetings then um, we won't be doing them weekly any longer for a while but we'll have one meeting in each of July August and September um, the dates venues and topics will be announced imminently but I can't give them to you yet, um, but watch this space or some other space. Um, I think that's it for parish announcements. So, um, Ian, over to you to reply to any points that you'd like to from the yeah. discussion. Yeah, thanks for um, that discussion and the questions. I actually find um, this kind of stuff intensely interesting, so I could talk about it for great length. I'll try not to, though. Um, so, Ed, do you think um, uh, we should discuss the nature of the Holy Trinity? Not land, labour and capital, but actually <laughs> the Holy Ghost and God and Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that for great length. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to step into um, the history of doctrinal debates of Christianity because I don't know much about it. Um, how, uh, Newton's Arianism, how much of, a, of an issue? Um, so I, as far as I understand, I'm not a historian, but as far as I understand it, basically everyone was a Christian. Um, and if you weren't, that was extremely odd and marked you out as someone dodgy. Uh, Arianism was a heresy. So he kept, Newton kept his personal beliefs um, secret, quiet. 
But anyway, I think it was a very principled person. So um, there was a moment where, in order to become Lucasian professor, he had to take holy orders. And I think that included a public um, assertion that he believed in, in the Trinity. And he didn't want to do that. And so he wouldn't get the professorship. He wouldn't get his money unless he did that. And he couldn't. So with the help of a friend, we didn't even tell the real reason why he didn't want to do it. He managed to get the king to waver that. And so I think all subsequent Lucasian professors didn't have to take holy orders. So that's the kind of thing that was going on with Newton's Arianism. It was quite a big issue for him. Um, is quantum gravity and string theory better than the theory of ether? I think um, I think the consensus is yes. Um, do I know much about quantum gravity and string theory? Probably, no, I don't really. I mean, I'm aware of it. I haven't studied it. Um, that's why I don't understand it. It's, it's a hot topic, explaining gravity and uh, unifying with quantum mechanics. But it's, the, the nature of gravity it remains a bit of an oddity in modern physical theory. It doesn't quite fit into the picture or the other part of the picture doesn't fit into it so it's still an ongoing issue what is the what's the real nature of gravity um what did newton mean when he said spirits could be the cause of new motion um well to answer that question properly i'd have to like go back to my the sources and, and really research it but my guess is that it's quite simple which is matter is passive spirit like god or christ is active with a will i don't think the word cognition is the right but it, you know it has its, its mind like and it can originate new events in the world it can be the unmoved mover it can be the original cause of new things it's not previously caused by other things that i think that's the kind of thing that's meant there um Right, so then there's interesting uh, two things about, um, you mentioned Stephen Wolfram's work, um, which is very new on trying to unify um, the fundamental theory of everything in terms of computation. And then Ed's point about, um, so the, th the, three, the three paradigms in history, in scientific history, the geometry, then um, mechanics, mathematical mechanics and then computation and maybe computation is a new third I genuinely definitely think computation is a new third thing but I would wouldn't I be a computer scientist but I definitely think that and so there's, there's loads of things to say there um, so the difference between geometry and mechanics is that geometry is static and mechanics is dynamic and that was the real big step forward which I didn't talk about at all was in itself is very interesting uh, which is the invention of the calculus which is the first time where change is is properly change of motion is properly formalized in mathematical terms that was an enormous breakthrough I mean it's it's as a, as a technolo technology of, of thought, it's had enormous repercussions, as I think everyone knows. Um, very recent, latest example is all the advances in AI and neural networks. That is, it's, just, it's just the calculus. So backpropagation is just an application of Newton's chain rule, but on a massive scale. So the calculus is like still reverberating around and having massive consequences. Newton, when he first introduced his laws of motion in the Principia um, communicated in a geometrical manner. He, he didn't present his theory of fluxions. Um, he used more of the method of exhaustion, geometrical method of exhaustion, which comes out from Galileo and earlier. So he presented it in a very geometrical way. And um, the magic of the calculus, he didn't really publish and kept quiet and was still kind of 
pulling it out, out his pocket to like solve mathematical puzzles late in life, um, which other people couldn't solve, uh, contributing to the idea of his incredible genius. He'd found um, a jewel really there. Um, and the question of the nature of the derivative, the thing that causes change, that's is it that itself was a real philosophical conundrum for Newton and Leibniz and all the people that came after him in terms of what that ontologically really was the derivative the thing that causes the change and it wasn't really until um, the 1800s that it was finally formalized in terms of concepts of continuity and mathematical limits um, that the confusion around it was largely removed I don't think fully so you still have physicists and kids being taught today at school concepts such as instantaneous velocity so velocity is distance moved over time and yet we're taught about instantaneous velocity which is an oxymoron anyway that's a whole uh, another topic so yeah mechanics uh, um, the mathematics the calculus was like suddenly everything had to be as you said, Newtonized, and that's in many ways been incredibly successful. But what we've discovered um, with the computational paradigm, and this we come to Wolfram's idea. Wolfram's definitely one of the people who has has made this point uh, repeatedly and clearly, but maybe isn't fully appreciated, is that um, this concept of computational irreducibility, which is the idea that some mechanical processes um, and therefore computational processes and if you go along with the church turing thesis all kinds of processes in the universe some of them can't be compressed and into simpler terms and so that they can be sort of predicted or understood quicker than just just observing the process itself there's irreducible amounts of computational work that are done and that in fact explains why there's whole areas of mathematics that for example don't have closed form solutions um, you can't solve some mathematical problems with a, si a simple straightforward equation because there's irreducible amount of computational work it would have to be um, compressed to reduce it down to such a simple equation and for some problems that simply cannot be done and um, so yeah Wolfram's been banging on about this for, for some time his recent work I find really interesting he proposes to unify quantum mechanics and gravity in terms of um, very very simple unobservable things which is essentially um, he views the universe as a huge re parallel rewriting machine that operates on a graph structure which represents both time and space. Um, and from this very simple computational starting point, he and his collaborators are able to um, deduce macro laws that are very much like laws of quantum mechanics and laws of general relativity. That's very interesting stuff. Uh, I, I like it. Uh, whether it's whether it will gain traction in the physics community, I have no idea. But that's just an example of how I think computation is has that kind of universal explanatory reach that geometry had and mechanics had. Um, but of course, you know, it doesn't mean that two, three hundred years from now or longer there'll be something else that comes along that is better. Um, finally, finally, um, prices gravitating to labor values. Now, the reason I use that word in, in that book and other people use that word. We shouldn't use that word. We shouldn't use gravitate really because it, it actually sounds very old fashioned. And that's because um, 
It's an attempt to distinguish the explanation of price movements from standard neoclassical theory and its explicit use of Smith's language to point out that we're taking the classical approach to economic theory as opposed to the neoclassical approach. Now, um, what is really meant, at least now, in terms of the price of gravitational <coughs> labor values, it means that it's a dynamic process which has um, an attractor point and that all other things being equal, that's all of us, you know, that hides up a, a load of complexity, just brush under the carpet there, all other things being equal, then prices would in fact move towards proportionality uh, with labor values suitably um, defined. Now, some people immediately object to that by pointing out that prices never uh, a proportion to labor values, certainly micro prices, no proportion to labor values. Um, so what's the point? And um, the point is, and I think this is a, is a Newtonian point, which is to really understand reality, you have to have a kind of depth ontology where you identify causal mechanisms that operate in conjunction with other causal mechanisms to create the empirical phenomena that we see. Newton's laws of motion, if you just read them, are not empirical statements. They're completely opposed to what actually happens empirically, right? Um, law of gravity, masses are attracted to each other. Well, look at all these shelves that are staying up. You know, that's, it's not an empirical statement. Neither is the statement that prices gravitate towards labor. It's not an empirical statement because there's lots of other things happening in reality that prevent prices from getting to labor, value, just as many things prevent things falling to the floor. Um, but the point is that is how um, really fruitful science proceeds is by identifying um, causal mechanisms how they, and how they operate in isolation and then putting them back together again to explain the complete uh, phenomena that's in front of you. And Newton was uh, brilliant at that. His laws of motion are a fantastic example of that kind of methodology. Uh, I think I'll stop. So thanks. Thanks very much, Ian. It was really interesting. Um, okay, uh, same time.